Okay, good afternoon and welcome back everyone. Um, so here we are with the water stream again. Um, just a couple of notes here before we get started. Uh, reminder um, to complete the survey today for a chance to win a prize. Um, and then keep track of your top three presentations and record that in the survey as well. Um, so this afternoon, um, we have Carl Sheehan, um, and he will be presenting Understanding and Applying the Different Levels of Machinery Condition Monitoring. So Carl has been providing automation solutions to various process industries for 24 years. Um, Carl holds an electrical engineering degree from Lakehead University and a diploma of technology in process control and instrumentation from BCIT. So please welcome Carl. <laughs> Great, thank you very much. Thanks Chris for the introduction there. Uh, as Chris said, I'm Carl Sheehan from Spartan Controls. At Spartan Controls I work in our operational excellence group and the focus of that group is to apply specific solutions to customer problems. So things like reliability, advanced process control, digital solutions and such. So today we're going to talk about condition monitoring which is really slanted towards reliability solutions. Um, what we're going to talk about specifically is first of all what exactly is condition monitoring with respect to monitoring machinery. Then we're going to talk about the different technologies that are available today for uh, condition monitoring. And then we'll finish off with how do we actually apply those technologies in specific reliability and predictive maintenance programs. So starting off with the what is condition monitoring? You know, very simply, condition monitoring is being able to use technology to detect in real time a fault within the piece of machinery while that piece of machinery is operating. So instead of waiting for that machine to fail and then do some diagnosis on it or take it apart to figure out what exactly what went wrong with it, we can apply different technologies to determine what that fault state is of that piece of equipment while it's still operating. So that in essence is condition monitoring. So what's the big deal about condition monitoring or why is that so important or I guess how can we actually leverage that? Well, let's take a look at this, what we call a standard PF curve. So what we're looking at here on the x-axis is time, and then on the y-axis we're taking a look at the equipment health. So we're just coming up with a generic number, zero to 100%. So obviously 100% means it's a brand new piece of equipment, it's completely healthy, whereas zero means that that piece of equipment has now failed to the point where it will no longer perform its duty. So what we see on this curve in that blue section is that over time, once we have a fault that gets generated in the piece of machinery, the performance or the health of that piece of equipment will degrade over time. And it'll eventually degrade to the point where you see it, that little circle there at the border between the blue and the red area. Once it reaches that point, it no longer performs its function. That is a functional failure, and that's the point at which we now have to repair that piece of machinery. So that's where the downtime comes into play. So you'll see that from that point of failure, we now have to schedule people to come in, get the parts, remove the piece of equipment, affect the repair, and then put it back on into service. Another very important point about this curve is not just about the failure of that piece of equipment, it's about the performance of that equipment. There's a direct correlation between performance and that fault. As that fault gets worse and worse, the performance of that piece of machinery degrades. A good example of that would be a heat exchanger. As a heat exchanger fouls, we have to expend more energy in the heat exchanger to transfer the heat to maintain the temperature coming out of that heat exchanger. As that fouling increases, we have to continue to apply more and more energy. So as that fault condition increases, the performance degrades as well. So with condition monitoring, if we can determine that point of failure or exactly what that failure is prior to it actually causing a shutdown, we have an opportunity to improve the First of all, the amount of time that the device is down, but as well as the cost associated with that. So for instance, in the prediction performance in that green section, if we can detect that fault much earlier, we can do all of that scheduling and planning work while the piece of equipment is still running. And as you can see very easily, that minimizes the amount of time that the equipment is down for us to actually affect the repair. No matter what happens, we have to repair that fault, but at least if we do all the planning and whatnot, 
while that piece of machinery is running, our actual downtime is less. So our opportunity, our reduced downtime can be fairly significant. I think an example that we can all relate to would be a vehicle. You know, you're driving your vehicle, on comes a check engine light. That is basically an indication of an imminent failure. We know that when we see that light, that indicates that the vehicle will fail imminently, so we have to do something about it. So now we're making a phone call to the dealership, we're planning a service repair, and we're actually taking the vehicle in and getting it fixed. So by waiting for that imminent failure, we now have to, our, our, I guess our, our lives are disrupted. Right? We now have to spend time getting that vehicle fixed. Well, what we're seeing now with the advent of new technology, like the Tesla here, for instance, is that there's all sorts of analytics and diagnostics that go on continuously in that vehicle that will tell us in real time that a failure is about, or that a failure could occur. The important part here is that it's not an imminent failure. We can still drive the vehicle, but at least now we know that at some point we are going to have to repair this before it actually causes the vehicle to shut down. But what this allows us to do now is to minimize the amount of time that we're without the vehicle. In some of these cases here, it's completely automated. This information goes to cloud-based service, which then goes to your dealership. Next thing you know, you're getting an email or a text from your dealer saying, hey, you need to bring your vehicle in. We have a time available next Thursday. Done. So that's what we're trying to move to with rotary equipment. So where's our opportunity here? What this graph here is showing you studies have been done in, in various industries that compare your top quartile performing companies to your lowest quartile performing companies. And the specific categories that they compare these companies are in safety, production, reliability, and emissions. And what we're showing in this um, display is that the companies that adhere to condition monitoring based maintenance or predictive maintenance that uses condition monitoring, we're seeing that across the board, those companies outperform the lowest quartile companies. So specifically, we're seeing much fewer recordable incidents as far as safety is concerned. Uh, we're seeing increased availability of our, of our equipment as well as reduced maintenance costs. We're seeing increases in production because now we're maintaining the performance of our equipment at 100% optimal performance all the time. And finally, we're reducing the emissions of CO2 because now, again, with optimal running uh, equipment, uh, we're getting maximum efficiency out of that equipment. Again, that heat exchanger is a great example. If we can maintain that heat exchanger at 100% efficiency, we're going to be using less energy to heat the fluid that's going through that heat exchanger. So that sort of explains what condition monitoring is and what the opportunity is. Now let's talk about some of the specific technologies involved with condition monitoring. So what we're going to use is the ubiquitous AC induction motor because no matter what industry you're in, you're going to see a lot of these AC motors. If we take a deeper look inside the AC motor, some of the specific parts that we're looking at are things like the rotor and the stator. Right? We apply electric current to the stator. That stator induces a, a, a magnetic flux into the rotor. The rotor then spins. You've got the mounting feet on the motor because we've got a lot of mass and inertia in that device. So as that rotor rotates, we need to keep it solid. So we have to have a good solid uh, set of mounting feet to anchor that motor to the uh, base. And of course, we've got an integral cooling fan as well because as that device runs, it gets hot. So we pull cold air to help cool off the, um, help cool off the motor. So those are, like our, are the main pieces of an AC induction motor. Now, how can that motor fail? Well, if you take a look at statistics, about 40% of the failures associated with an electric motor due to the bearings. Okay, so the bearings maintain the rotor in its, on its axis as it spins. You get 30% or 38% are stator faults, 10% are rotor faults, and about 12% are just other. So of all the different fault conditions, we can kind of group those into two specific categories. You've got mechanical faults, you've got electric faults. Well, we've got different means or different indicators of those fault conditions. The ones I'm showing you right here are vibration, temperature, and lubrication. There are others, but just for the sake of you know, um, time, we're only going to focus on these three. Actually, we're only going to focus on vibration for now because I don't have enough time to get into the other two. But essentially, these specific indicators, vibration, temperature, and lubrication, we can take measurements of these parameters online, and through those measurements, we can determine what fault condition exists in that piece of machinery. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a slightly deeper dive here into vibration, just to give you an example of the type of information that we can get from a vibration signal. So first of all, we need to understand what exactly is vibration. 
So vibration defined is the motion of a body about a reference point caused by an undesirable mechanical force, okay? So if you want to take a look at some specific causes of vibration, you've got imbalance. So if you've got an impeller that's got uh, some buildup on one of the veins, you can see an imbalance of that. That's going to lead to vibration. Misalignment between the shaft of the motor and the shaft of the asset that it's moving. So it could be a pump, could be a fan. Um, if there's any looseness in that bearing or if there's any uh, slop in that drive chain, that would lead to um, vibration, as will you know, mechanical wear on the bearing assembly itself. We'll take a slightly deeper look into each of these and show you exactly what we measure and what we can find out. So if you want to take a look at vibration, the animation here is showing you, if we were to measure the vibration at that point of the arrow on the uh, pump as it spins there, if we've got that heavy spot, as that heavy spot rotates around the impeller, you'll see that the amplitude of our signal changes sinusoidally as that moves around. You'll see that for alignment, we have to align the motor shaft with the shaft of the pump or the fan that we're driving. If we're offset by a you know, set amount or if we have like a, a difference in the angle between the motor and the pump, uh, those two misalignments will lead to excessive vibration. And as that vibration increases, it can lead to a, a actual failure in our device. Soft foot is a situation where, again, we talked about the amount of mass and inertia that's in that motor, in that pump. So as that mass and inertia is rotating, if we don't properly anchor that asset to the ground, the vibration could increase to the point where we actually get a failure. So some of the different types of soft foot, you can get parallel soft foot or angular soft foot. It could be with the device itself or with the, with the, rotor it's, uh, the motor itself, or it could be with the foundation underneath that motor. Either way, if we don't have a good solid connection between that motor and the foundation to anchor it in place, we could get excessive vibration that could lead to a failure condition. So now we understand that vibration is a good indication of specific faults that could lead to a failure. The idea is that there's always going to be some vibration. There's an acceptable amount of energy or force from that vibration. As a fault condition increases, the amount of vibration or the amplitude of that vibration signal will increase to eventually to the point where it causes an actual mechanical failure. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to measure that vibration and take a look at the amplitude associated with the vibration associated with each of those faults. And that's what we're going to get into here in a minute. But first of all, we need to understand how we actually measure vibration. So what we're showing you here is a, is a piezoelectric crystal-based accelerometer. We install this accelerometer directly onto the in this case here, the motor. So you see we've got two accelerometers, one mounted to measure the horizontal vibration, one, measure, one installed to measure the vertical vibration. In each of those sensors, what you have is a piezoelectric crystal that suspends a mass. And then you put that whole sensor on the device, in this case, the motor. As that vibration starts to increase, it induces a, a signal or it causes that crystal to vibrate and produce an electric signal. And we then take that electric signal from the crystal and that's what we measure in our signal conditioning and our, in our measuring device. So the crystal allows us to convert that physical vibration into an electric signal that we could actually measure. So what does an actual measurement or that electrical signal look like? Well, again, if you take a look at the graphic right here, some of the basics, when we take a look at that, that rotor or that shaft rotating at one times the, the turning frequency of one RPM, you'll see looking at that heavy spot, you'll see the amplitude of that vibration will increase sinusoidally as that heavy spot moves around. Looking at the next graphic down, you'll see that if we've got a pump or a fan, there's a number of blades associated with that. Every time one of the blades of that fan rotates around the measurement point, we'll get another amplitude change in our, in our vibration. And then similarly, when you've got a gearbox, depending on the number of teeth in your gear mesh, as we go through each one of those teeth, we will induce some impacting and cause some vibration. So what we're showing you here is that different components, and this is key, different components in that piece of machinery will vibrate at a different frequency. So the trick is, if we take a look at it right here, putting it all together, if I have a pump that has all these parts ro rotating in there, every single component will cause a different frequency in that vibration signal, okay? Now, unfortunately, we don't see those individual frequency in the time-based waveform. The time waveform actually looks like, is more like this, okay? 
you'll just see a whole messy signal. If you want to take a look at an example of a real-time uh, data capture from a portable device, this is what your vibration signal looks like. So buried in that signal are different frequencies that we associate with different pieces of, or different mechanical uh, parts within that um, asset that we're monitoring. So how do we break those out? Well, we do some math on it. We do a fast Fourier transform. So by taking that time-based waveform, running this mathematical algorithm, a fast Fourier transform, we convert it into a series of frequency signals or, or frequency um, spectrum, each of those with a separate amplitude. So now what we can do is we can isolate the amplitude of the frequency associated with each of those parts in that device. So we have to do some math on that, on that signal. So again, kind of another way of looking at it right here, if I take that time-based waveform and I extrapolate it out over the frequency domain, I can see that at different frequencies, I can measure the amplitude associated with each of those mechanical um, devices in that piece of equipment. So when I take a look at that, what we talked about previously, for instance, balance occurs at the one times turning speed, the lowest frequency. So you see on there, we'll take a look at the amplitude of that specific um, spectrum or that, that specific um, uh, spectrum in our, in, our, in our spectrum. For alignment, we're maybe looking at two times turning speed. Bearings will occur at different turning speeds just because there's a number of bearings involved in there, gears and such. So the idea is that we understand what frequencies we expect to see specific faults associated with different pieces in that device. And then what we can do is we can trend each of those uh, frequencies over time and see if they actually exceed an alarm point. So you see here, for instance, we're taking a look at the uh, 50 times turning speed associated with uh, certain bearings. Once the amplitude of that uh, vibration at that frequency increases above an alarm point, that's a trigger to us. It tells us that we have a problem with that bearing. So similarly, we can go through temperature and we can go through lubrication and we can talk about some of the specific technologies or the, some of the indicators of how we actually use those measurements in a condition monitoring program. We just don't have the time today. So I'm going to park temperature and lubrication for now. We'll move on to the next point of our discussion. So now what we're going to talk about is how do we actually take all of those technologies and implement those in a predictive maintenance program? Because that's the key. It's one thing to actually monitor and determine the condition of the asset while it's running. It's quite another to actually use that effectively to perform the maintenance without causing any downtime. So we'll talk about how we kind of roll those together into uh, different programs. So on this slide here, what I'm showing you are sort of like the four different levels. Um, we can go from what we call on-demand to planned to predictive to full prescriptive analytics. There's different ways that we can combine these technologies. The next few slides, I'm going to go through each one of those individually. But I want to make a few notes about this slide first. First of all, what I'm not showing you or what I'm not saying on this slide is that any one program is better than another. All those programs will use different technologies in a different way. Some of those technologies are going to be appropriate for large plants. Some of those technologies are going to be appropriate for smaller plants. Some of those technologies are going to be appropriate for large uh, maintenance teams. Some are going to be uh, geared towards smaller maintenance teams. So there is no right or wrong answer. There is no this program is better than this program is better than this program. It's a case of what is the best program that applies to my facility. Other thing to note about this too is that there is no kind of clear delineation point. It's, oh, I'm either going to do strictly an on-demand system or I'm going to do a strictly predictive system. Based on the technologies, you can blend a little bit of both. You may have some of your most critical high value assets with full prescriptive analytics, whereas maybe some of your less critical assets that you don't need to look at as frequently, maybe we can do those on demand. So what we'll do now is we'll get into some of the specific um, programs. So the first one is our traditional conventional on demand. So this would be where we actually have a technician that comes out and connects a portable analyzer and looks at specific measurements at different points on that piece of machinery. So they can be looking at vibration, they can be looking at temperatures, they can be looking at pressures and whatnot. But the idea is that you physically go out to the device, you install your sensors, you take those measurements. Now, no matter what type of program you use, this type of analysis gives you the highest resolution, okay, because you're able to to sample the data directly at the device at super high frequencies. So this gives you the best resolution. The drawback of this type of a program is that it's very manual based and it takes quite a bit of time. A technician has to go out into the field, 
physically connect their instruments or their sensors, take the measurements, and then move on to the next uh, disconnect and then go on to the next asset. So when you start taking a look at how frequently are you going to be doing individual assets, it could be about a month by the time that, that technician can come back to that one asset. So the drawback is that a lot can happen depending on the failure mode. A lot can happen in one month. You may go from an asset running perfectly fine to complete failure within a one month period. So the concern about a program like this in a large facility is that you may miss certain fault conditions because you're not testing frequently enough. The other aspect of this is that once we take that data, we then will bring it back into a specific software application, do our analysis, generate a report, and then from that report we figure out what maintenance we need to do on that device. And those reports is where we start telling us very specific fault conditions like balance issues, misalignment, and so forth. Kind of progressing to the next level above that is we replace the person running around in the field with their portable analyzer with online measurements. There's many different ways that we can be bringing those online measurement information into our centralized system. What I'm showing you here on the slide is kind of a wireless solution, which is a way that a lot of our customers are going because the wireless solution does not require pulling cable out into the field. We don't need the super high frequency and resolution that you need in like a DCS or a SCADA system. So it's a much uh, more cost effective infrastructure to put in place to bring this condition monitoring information into your centralized system. But like I said, it doesn't have to be wireless. You can have wired solutions as well. But the concept doesn't change. The idea is I'm now installing permanent mounted devices or measurements on my assets out in the field. I'm bringing that information back into my software application where I can now run my reports. So what's different about this is that we no longer have to spend time installing our sensors on each device. We can bring that information in. So instead of looking at, say, monthly frequency for analyzing a device, we can now be taking a look at it hourly. We can use those measurements and those amplitudes to trigger when a technician should actually be taking a deep dive and doing the actual analysis. So the hands-on analysis of the data still requires a, a technician, a human being, to interpret the data to figure out exactly what the fault is, but we can do that analysis much more frequently because we're not spending our time running around the field taking the measurements. At the end of the day, we're still getting the same information. We're still determining what the specific fault conditions are. Progressing to that next level, with previous two kind of programs had one thing in common. It required a technician, a person, to actually analyze the data using software tools, but to determine the specific fault conditions by doing an analysis on the data. What we're seeing now, the next progression, and this is what we're, we're seeing in, in industry today, is that that analysis is being done in the device itself. Instead of that device is giving us raw information, this is my vibration signal, this is my temperature signal, the device is actually executing known failure modes effect analysis rules and telling us exactly what the fault conditions are. So in this case here, we don't need a technician to analyze the data. The device itself gives us that information. So I apologize for this slide. I know that it's fairly busy and whatnot, but I'm just giving you a flavor here of the specific known failure modes that we know for each of those devices or each of the fault conditions. So for balance, for instance, we know that if we analyze the two times turning speed, the running speed amplitude, and the three times uh, turning speed, and if we do some averaging between those, we can figure out if we have a balance issue or not. So there are specific known rules that we can apply to the data that will automate a lot of that analysis. And that's exactly what we're doing now. We're putting that logic, we're putting that capability in the devices themselves. So now you don't need a human being to do the basic analysis. The device is telling us when it has a fault. So instead of having a human being do it, it's the device is telling us what our specific fault conditions are. So that's the more predictive. The next level, or I guess the highest level, are what we call prescriptive analytics. What we talked about in that previous example was using what we call known failure mode effects analysis, or we know how a bearing will fail, or we know how alignment will per perpetuate and what al uh, misalignment looks like. We know what that signature, or what the information would look like for that fault condition. But there's a lot of other fault conditions that we don't know. And this is where we get into full-scale analytics. Once you start getting into a full-scale analytics program, 
typically you're going to need a lot more information than just that information or those sensors that you've installed on your device. You may want to correlate that to historical process data from your data historian. You may need to take a look at other measurements from the DCS or information from instruments through that DCS. So the whole idea now is when you get into prescriptive analytics program, you're taking data from multiple sources, consolidating that data, and then doing your analysis on all this information not just the specific asset that you're taking a look at. So obviously this requires a lot more infrastructure and requires a lot more software and it requires a lot more expertise around the uh, analytical techniques or the analytical tools. You know, we had talked previously about our examples of what we call principle driven. So we know what a bearing failure should look like so we can develop our rules to detect that. But what we're seeing now or what we're trying to get to is we don't go in with any preconceived ideas or any preconceived notions. We're going to let the data tell us what's actually going wrong with the asset or with the process. Maybe that failure mode in that asset is an indication of a process condition. So when we start getting into this data driven, this is where we're getting into like machine learning, principal component analysis, all these advanced analytical tools. And this is where you also need to have that discipline. A person like myself, uh, an engineer that you know, has a, you know, undergrad engineering degree, I do not have the technical discipline or the technical capability to run these type of algorithms. These are where you have dedicated data scientist professionals that can take a look at that data and draw these correlations. You can only do so much with the software, you still have to have that discipline. So this is why we're saying that this level of program may not be appropriate for a small plant that only has a handful of assets. But if you're a large you know, pulp mill or a major wastewater treatment plant, maybe there could be some information that you can find useful in this kind of a program. So as an example of what we're talking about here, look at a root cause analysis, okay? So what we could have here is at the end of the day, our, our symptom that we're actually seeing, the fault condition that we're seeing, could be a low compressor comp performance. Well, if you take a look, that's on the far right-hand side, that square with the P in the far right you'll see that that low compressor performance can be caused by either um, low discharge pressure or high discharge temperature. And then each of those subconditions can be caused by other conditions. So essentially what we can do is we can build a set of rules using that data that can start to trace that low compressor performance back to exact, its exact root causes and it goes up the chain. So we, we go from that low compressor performance to a uh, low discharge pressure and then realize, oh, that's actually being caused by low speed, which is actually being caused by the next chain and so on until we get to the actual root cause of that low compressor performance is actually expander vibration. So we've taken the symptom and we figured out exactly based on all these potential causes what is actually causing that problem. That's root cause analysis. And as you can see, it's much more indicative or it's much more specific than your standard idiot light, right? The traditional check engine light, you have no idea what that means. You just know, okay, I gotta take that in the dealer to figure out what's going on with it. With prescriptive analytics and root cause analysis as an example, you can figure out exactly what's causing that performance problem. So to summarize here, just kind of in general, in general terms, when you take a look at your current or your traditional condition monitoring strategies, they involved manual collection of data, bringing that data into a centralized location, performing a manual analysis on that, and then generating a report to drive the action. What we're actually moving to now with the more modern techniques of predictive and prescriptive analytics are things like installing permanent devices in the field to take those measurements, and then having those devices either perform some of the basic analysis or at least give you some of the information where you can do more automated analysis on your end applying advanced analytical tools to that data and then correlating not just the measurements from those devices but other measurements from other data sources within your facility as well. And then the idea is the visualization piece, right? Instead of having to have somebody log into a piece of software to take a look at a list of problems, we can get email notifications or we can get SMS notifications when there actually is a fault condition or if we need help analyzing it, we can have experts remotely connect into our uh, analytics platform and help us with the analysis. So technology has really opened the door or just really broadened what we can do with these condition monitoring systems. And this is exactly what we're seeing the shifts in industry now is that as this technology is becoming more prevalent and as it's becoming more cost effective, we're seeing much more um, use and incorporation of this technology into their uh, maintenance programs. 
So without getting into a whole lot of um, great details, I just want to share with you a couple of specific um, customers that have realized some benefits by transitioning from your more conventional condition monitoring programs into more predictive or prescriptive analytics-based programs. So one is a um, propane, uh, liquefied propane terminal that we've been involved with. And in the first months of operation of using a predictive maintenance program, so this is where they're installing a lot of field measurements, bringing that information in and doing the analysis locally, um, they identified in eight months over 200 potential fault conditions, and then they were able to mitigate those before they actually cause any operational failure. So 200 fault conditions in eight months is pretty impressive. We've also got a, a pulp and paper mill customer. So it's a large facility, right? They'll have you know thousands of motors, for instance, and many, many pumps and whatnot. They had a conventional condition-based monitoring program, and they transitioned to a predictive maintenance program. So when they first started that transition was back in 2006. And in 2006, by doing all sorts of their, their manual or on-demand-based condition monitoring, they were able to detect 50, or they, they still suffered from 52 unpredicted failures. So these are the ones that they missed, right? They're, they were doing their condition monitoring as frequently as they could, but they missed 52 failure conditions. By 2019, you'll see that we were down well into the single digits, you know, three, four, and one in the previous three years. So now by doing this, they're having much fewer um, unpredicted failures, which means that their uptime is much better, which means that overall production and performance of the mill is much better. So to summarize, condition monitoring is basically detecting faults in machinery in real time without having to take that piece of machinery down. That enables us to transition from a reactive to a predictive maintenance program. We can determine the fault and we can schedule how to repair that fault while the asset is still running and the asset has not actually gone to a catastrophic failure. There are all sorts of different um, fault conditions and different condition monitoring technologies available. And we said there is no right or wrong answer. There's going to be an appropriate technology for your facility based on the size of your facility, your staff, and such. Um, these technologies can be applied to different programs. And like we said, there is no delineation between it has to be predictive or it has to be um, on demand or it has to be planned. You can use technology in one program uh, where you can apply different technologies or you can have a mix of different programs uh, using those technologies. And finally, what we do see is that the application of these technologies drive quantifiable business results, going from 52 undetected errors down to two or three undetected errors. There is a tangible benefit in the amount of uptime on that plant and incremental increase of production in that plant. So that brings us to the end of my presentation. I guess we'll open it up for questions. Thank you very much, Carl. That, uh, that was a very informative presentation. It was well done. Um, we have a couple of questions here from the audience. Um, is the monitoring program based on reliability-centered maintenance program? I guess it's, I don't know if you can say it's based on, well, I guess I use the two sort of interchangeably or not so much interchangeably. For a reliability-centered maintenance program, you need to do condition monitoring, right? If you're, if you're not doing condition monitoring, you're not doing reliability-centered maintenance. What that condition monitoring looks like, that could be something like using portable analyzers, um, or it could be using more analytics or online devices. But the whole idea around reliability-centered maintenance is shifting away from, we're going to take that pump down every three months and do a repair on it. That's, that's preventive maintenance, but that, it's, a, it's a very simple form, whereas reliability-centered maintenance gets much smarter. It's when do I actually need to do the repair on that asset, and you need to do condition monitoring to determine when you need to actually do that. So it's, the, the two are very closely related, absolutely. Um, it's, it's, you know, my feeling or, or, or the way I look at it is that you need to have condition monitoring to be able to do true reliability-centered maintenance. Thank you for that. That, uh, that was good. Um, 
Um, another question here, uh, could sensors be connected to SCADA? Yeah, absolutely. So what you, depending on the sensor, so simple things like pressure, temperatures, those can obviously come directly into the SCADA system. Uh, even things like vibration, you can bring into your SCADA system. But what you need to understand though is that um, we showed, and that's why I, I specifically chose vibration because it's a little bit tricky, bringing that raw overall vibration signal into your SCADA system. I, I don't have a slide here to show you, but what you can, what you will see is that by the time your overall vibration indicates a fault condition, you really don't, it, it's pretty much, it's like the idiot light in the car, like you, that device will fail looking at that raw overall signal. What you need to do with vibration to use it as a truly predictive indication of the condition of that asset is you need to do that fast Fourier transform. You need to break that signal down into individual frequency components and you need to take a look at the amplitude at each frequency because it's that specific frequency amplitude that will tell you what your fault condition is. And what we have seen are situations where if you take a look at the spectrum, the spectrum clearly indicates that you've got a fault condition. But when you take a look at the corresponding overall vibration signal, it's not, there's not enough energy in the overall signal to detect that. So what winds up happening is that by the time, you know, if you're bringing that overall vibration signal into your SCADA system to try to tell the operator when they have a problem with the motor or with the pump, by the time that overall vibration signal tells them they have a, a problem, it's imminent. You don't really have much time. So there are techniques though where you can do that sort of intermediary signal conditioning. So you do that fast Fourier transform and then you send those individual amplitudes to the SCADA system and now you're giving operators more meaningful information. You're saying, well, this is your one times turning speed or what we can do is that you can do some rules to generate an actual overall health condition is kind of what we do. So we'll say here's a zero to 100%. We do the fast Fourier transform, we apply the rules, we say here's a health condition, zero to 100%. So now you know if it's at 100%, you're 100% healthy. If it's at 50%, you're 50% healthy. We do the math, but the SCADA system sees a real result, and that's what the operators are, are more interested in, is what do I need to know so I can schedule maintenance on that asset. Okay, thank you. Um, I think we have one more question here. Um, do you need to have need to have ether, Ethernet hookup, correct? Yeah, so on that wireless infrastructure, for instance, you've got a, uh, a gateway. So that gateway wirelessly connects to all of your wireless field devices. That gateway will now have, oh, you could use Modbus RTU, which is a 485 wire connection, but the standard is Ethernet. And then from Ethernet, you can use protocols like Heart IP, Modbus TCP, to bring that information from that gateway back to your DCS, or your SCADA system, or your plant historian using standard Ethernet. Um, other of those online systems are typically Ethernet based as well, so Ethernet is the standard, and then you can do a combination of Wi-Fi or actually wired Ethernet. Okay, thank you. Um, that was a great presentation. Uh, thank you very much for being able to come in today and, uh, and do this for us. Uh, we have presenting today um, and for everybody else out there we will be back at two o'clock for the next presentation thank you awesome. thank you